so this Saturday, I went to a Star Wars burlesque show called The Empire Strips Back. (laughs) I don't know if he's serious or not. And so, oh, I'm dead serious. And so if you picture what it is, it's exactly what it is. Welcome to Drunk Real Estate. Grab a drink and enjoy the show. Hey there, welcome to episode 57 of Drunk Real Estate. I am Kyle Wilson, Ashley Wilson's husband. We, but guys, we got to get this going. Like it's, <laughs> I know you're in the middle. We got to get this going. We got a lot to talk about this week. We had a couple guys off last week, but we do have the whole gang back together today. So uh, Mauricio, how's it going, buddy? Are we, are we live? Are we gone? <laughs> yeah, we're live. Yeah, I think you took a nap there while we debated. Uh... Dude, it's been like 30 minutes of just back and forth of like whatever. And I'm like, okay, good. So what are we doing today? Dude, Mauricio got time to study. He is so prepared. Ooh, I'm so prepared. I had, an, I had a 45 minute preparation while these bozos were going back and forth about, you know, who shot who and like, you know. So Mauricio will be prepared for the first time ever. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm good, man. I'm back. Uh, I'm, ba- I'm back, right? Have I been gone? I've been gone, right? I have been. Yeah, been gone. You have, and we missed I'm you. back. It's been two weeks. Uh, as much as I loved it, it's nice to be home. Yeah, just trying to get back in the swing of things. What are you? Uh, what are you drinking tonight? I'm back to the peace. I'm almost done. Look at this. Look at this. Is that so? Is that what you're doing? You're just going to keep drinking pisco until your bottle's done, and then you're going to move on. Yeah, I got the other bottle, but the other one's the Peruvian one. It's not great. Somebody was asking. They didn't know what it was. So this is like really good stuff. It's grape based. It's just, it's like wine, but it's like hard alcohol. And uh, you know what I mix it with, Kyle? A little ginger ale, a little Pisco ginger ale. Oh, it's so tasty. The ginger piss. Whenever, mm. uh, whenever. Uh, oh, good. It, it's so good when it, when, it hit your, when it hits your lips. It's so good when it hits your lips. <laughs> That's what well, that's what they get whenever AJ gets uh, drug tested. The ginger piss. Jay, how's it going, that's buddy? That's exactly right. <laughs> um, all, all I will say is the 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 our, our listeners and fans should be thanking us for getting all the politics out of our system, uh, arguing amongst ourselves before this show before for the last six or seven hours. I think it's been. So. <laughs> I don't even think it was politics. It was conspiracy theories. One of us here believes Trump didn't get hit by a bullet, and I'm not going to call them out, but there's one of us here. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's okay. We love you anyway, AJ. Um, Trust me. It's not me. <laughs> I don't think it's the Trump supporter. Jay, what are you drinking tonight? Um, I I am drinking. Um, my wife, Carol, grabbed a bottle of wine out of nowhere. I don't know what it is, and uh, here's what I'm drinking. But it is from Costco. Uh, this is not from Costco. This is a good bottle. This is uh, my Trader Joe's. My, nope. 99 cent store. This, this is my favorite winery, uh, Ridge, up in uh, the mountains of Mountain View, California. Wow. Um, and uh, Carol and I have finished uh, this like 1.5 liter bottle over the last couple of days. And I'm down to my, my last big glass. So just enjoying that. So even even when it's a nice bottle, that's so Jay doesn't want to spend full price, so he gets the extra large just to make sure he gets his money's worth. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought is that not part of the that mysterious box that people keep sending you wine in a box that you don't know who it's from? It's not no, like- no, th- th- this is this was uh, this was bought. This was a gift. I don't remember from whom, but uh, whoever <laughs> sent me the uh, this this big bottle of Ridge because they know it was my favorite. Thank you, AJ. What's going on, man? Well, I think Costco is going to be upset because Jay didn't give a shout out any wine. They're not going to be too happy. Jay's over here cheating on Costco wine, but I bought a case. I bought a case last week. I'm 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 good with okay. Costco okay. wine for a while. Okay, there we go. There we go. Go good. I got my Red Bull here in Southern California and uh, chilling. Mauricio didn't want me to hang out with him though, so that's okay. Dude, I didn't even know you were here. It's like I was like, he's like, I've got to go to the Dodger game. I'm like, where was my invite? Or, or I, invite I literally you. was asking you today if I could go on on the message. Guarantee, though, it makes sense why you were ignoring our messages, but <laughs> our, in, in our in our thread. So I understand. But I asked if I could come over <laughs> and, and do it with you. But that's okay. It's okay. Just ignore me, Mauricio. AJ, AJ, when you get to the point where you you run your own multi million dollar companies, then then maybe you can you can 
you know, realize how it works. Yeah, once he gets that third jet, that's when he's going to figure it all out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, so we're, we're people don't know this, but we're taping a little bit early, so AJ can go to his uh, his baseball game. So usually my bourbon, that's kind of like an after dinner drink. We're before dinner right now, so I felt like I should go something fresh, keep me a little bit light. And I went into the fridge, and I just found this. It's called Clear. It's it's uh, it's, it's, it's cucumber mint. It's very refreshing. Oh, I've heard I've heard about that. Is that the is that the uh, the the fourteen times distilled uh, clear rum? No sugar, no yeah, carbs. It's, it's all all American too. So like, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're into that. Uh, Mauricio doesn't seem like he's into that. Is that the piss rum? Hey, 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 hey. No, the, the, that's that's what you're drinking every week. I, I promise, Mauricio, I will try Pisco. It's not that I I think it's disgusting. It's that I'm waiting. I, I'll try it when I'm with you. I want my first we'll time to we'll be with you, Mauricio. We're all, we'll do it when we're all together at Limitless. Yeah. Well, I'm not coming to Limitless. Stop, stop trying to make fetch work. All right, let's uh, let's get this going. Because um, Jay was off last week, so it's been a little while since we took a look at the economy. Uh, even though we're waiting on some pretty key reports Thursday, Friday, and we got a Fed meeting next week, we thought we would sneak in a little, just a tiny bit of a economic update. So, uh, Jay, what have you been uh, paying attention to while you've been out of cell service and off in Guatemala or wherever you were? Yeah, so um, I've tried not to pay attention to anything, but I, I want to address something before I jump into my, my quick economic update, um, because I, I take heat for this regularly, and so it's worth addressing. Um, I get a lot of people who send me emails or make comments to me um, about my economic updates. And a lot of times it goes along the lines of, Jay, you just don't get it. You keep saying the economy's strong, but how do you not see that there are a lot of Americans out there that are struggling? How do you not see that that we're clearly in a recession because there are a lot of people? Jay's, who, Jay's DMs are apparently just filling up. He's getting all these DMs in back channel. <laughs> They're basically from me and AJ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, it's just I'm, me and Mauricio. I'm, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> Okay, but no, but seriously, to me and Mauricio, I do. you are. I, no, seriously, I do get those comments from people basically saying that I'm out of touch, and I say the economy is doing great, the economy is strong. Um, not that I've been saying that as much recently, but I'm 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 missing the fact that so many people are struggling, and so I just want to kind of touch on this because yeah, I do get it, and I and. I talk about the economy and on this show a lot, we talk about the economy from a macro level. Um, and I'm not talking about, and we're not talking about individual circumstances of the people in the economy. I'm not saying that's not important. It's actually really important. It's tremendously important um, because it's, it's probably more important than the macro, but it's a separate discussion than what we talk about here. Um, it's like the difference between discussing whether Amazon, amazon.com, the company is doing well and whether its employees at Amazon are all making a reasonable salary or reasonable wage. So the company made a half trillion dollars last year. No argument. I don't think any stock trader or investor, anybody that follows Amazon would say Amazon didn't kick ass last year. But that doesn't mean that all the employees at Amazon are doing well. And so they're two different things. And it's the same thing with the economy. The economy can be doing really well, but that doesn't mean that the distribution of money throughout the economy is necessarily good. The economy can be great, can be generating lots of money, but if too much of that money is flowing to a small group of people at the top, then there's going to be a lot of people suffering. And so um, I, I think that's a really important discussion to have. And I think we should have that discussion. And, and I'll put it on the list of things to discuss uh, in the near future. But for now, I just kind of want to make it clear that when I'm discussing the economy, if I say the economy is strong or the economy is weak, I'm talking about the overall economy. And I'm not talking about like specifically the circumstances of individuals in the economy. Again, very important topic, but it's not what I'm talking about. And when we talk about recessions, typically we don't evaluate how groups of people in the economy are doing. We evaluate the macro economy overall. So that's, that's, that's all I want to say about that before. Okay, well said, Jay. Well said. Okay. Moving on. So how is the economy doing? <laughs> 
Let me guess. It's doing great, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the economy, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, we talked about, I think it was jobs, the last thing we talked about. And, and basically what we had determined was the trend is down. The trend is softening. The economy softening, not to the point where we're in a recession yet. Um, I don't think most people would say, um, but things are definitely softening and slowing down. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is um, kind of that trend continuing, not tremendously, not not, not like accelerating, but we're still starting to slow down. So since the last time we had an economic update, we saw some inflation numbers. Uh, CPI came out for June, and what we saw is a negative inflation month for the first time in I don't remember how long. And CPI is down to three point. Uh, C- PI is down to 3% for the year from 3.3% uh, last month. Core CPI came in a little bit over zero at, I think, 0.1%. We're at about 3.3% for the year. Um, core PC and PCE came in at 2.5% for the year, so we're approaching that 2% number. But here's the really good news. Here's the, the one thing we've been tracking is that shelter – that number, that that component of, of inflation that we've been looking at for two years and saying, how is that not coming down, finally started to come down. So we saw uh, last month uh, shelter increase at 0.2% month over month, which still probably a little bit higher than, than what we all think it really is, but that's pretty close to the Fed target. And so it's, it's good that that one number that we've kind of been looking at and saying this number doesn't make sense is actually now starting to make sense. So Inflation's continuing to slow down, so that's one indicator um, that that we may be in for a rate cut in September, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Other thing um, is later this week, we get our first glimpse at the GDP number, like the overall output of the economy for Q2. Um, in Q1, that number was pretty weak, surprisingly weak, um, though if you adjust it for a couple of factors that it should be adjusted for, it wasn't that bad. But Q2 is, in the past week, actually looking stronger than what we were expecting just a few weeks ago. That number will probably come in somewhere around 2 or 2.5%, two maybe even a little bit higher, um, which is an indication that things are continuing to chug along. Fed meets next week. Um, I think it's pretty much agreed upon that we're not going to see a a rate cut next week. We're certainly not going to see a rate hike. So most likely in in July, we're going to just see uh, Powell make some remarks and and we'll have no movement in, in, in the federal funds rate. No Fed meeting in August. And then the next Fed meeting is, is in September. And based on the current data, um, we're looking like, let me pull this up here. Um, we're looking like there is almost certain based on, on market expectations to be a rate cut in September. 96% chance. 96% chance. There is a 93.6% chance of a one rate cut and a 2.5 actually that it's going to be two. Yep. Yep. There we go. And so about a 4% chance of it staying the same, 96% chance that that we're going to see a cut in September. Which isn't that kind of crazy? When you think about this logically, there's a 97% chance of no rate cut this week, but then a 96% chance of a rate cut next. That's the, One of those two numbers has to be too high. Yeah, it basically says that people are almost 100% certain that the data that we're going to get over the next two months is going to be negative, but it's not so bad that we should be cutting now, which is kind of crazy. We, we have new PCE Friday, right? Like in PCE, core PCE is what the Fed uses as their preferred inflation indicator. So we could have PCE come in above what was expected and all of a sudden, like, throw your 96% out the window then. So, yeah. So, Friday is going to make a big difference. So, obviously, it's after the July meeting. So, it's not going to impact what the, the Fed decides for, for this month. Actually, no. I'm sorry. It's the not, July it's right meeting before. is next week. Sorry. Yes, yeah. They have, GD, is- they have GDP and PCE right before. So, like... They should have everything they need, right? Like, hundred percent. So it's very possible something changes before next week. I don't think so. Either way, like, it, 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 let's say it's super low. You're telling me that there's only a three percent chance that if it's super low and we had two low in a row, that they're not going to consider cutting. Like, and while this GDP's at you know one point four again or lower, and that we have PC, like that's only a three percent chance of them cutting. I don't know. It just seems a little, little bleak. Yep, I I, I agree with you. 
And, and so we, we could be surprised. I mean, it is looking like GDP is going to come in relatively strong this quarter, but we thought the same thing last quarter and it didn't happen. So yeah, if there are any surprises with either GDP or, or inflation data later this week, could change something next week. But yeah, I, I agree with you that it is very weird that everybody is so convinced nothing's going to change for July, but that it's going to be so bad that uh, over the next two months that they're going to have to cut in September. That's just, that's, it's, it's weird. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing is too, that everyone's saying next week, he has to, if he's cutting or if he even plans on cutting a little bit, he has to telegraph it just because of the whole election thing. He doesn't want to seem like he's being influenced by any election things or like whatever. He has to come out and basically telegraph. This is what I plan on doing. So we can seem bipartisan and impartial. So hopefully next week he'll we'll start to hear a little bit of rumblings of, oh, yeah, maybe it'll be time. Yeah. I mean, I still personally think that we're behind the curve. I think we waited too long to cut. Um, and so I think we're going to look back and say uh, waiting till September was too long. But that's just a guess. Not, not, not to it. <laughs> I'm going to apologize right off the bat, not to inject politics into this, but AJ made a point earlier today, which I thought was great, which is kind of hard to disentangle the economics versus the politics. I'm just curious as to with the change now in the, in the political situation, I mean, yes, the Fed's supposed to be non-political, right? But I'm just wondering if that's had an effect at all. That Now he's no longer talking to, you know, the, the president, he's making whatever discussions having with the president. Now he's got somebody else that he's talking to and he's kind of up in the air who's going to be that. Do you think that has any effect at all on how he acts in the months leading up to the election? Here, here's the problem I have. And people talk about is Powell political? Does he make partisan decisions? Um, are, are other Fed chairs political? Um, first, obviously, I hope they're not. You don't want them to be. But the other question is, if they are, what side are they on? And is it is it a left and right thing? Is it an incumbent versus versus um, uh, the opposite party thing? Are they trying to like keep their job? Are they trying? Uh, it's so that that's the big question. If they are partisan, and I'd like to think that they're that they're not, but everybody's partisan to some degree. It's it's impossible not to be. Um, but what where where does their where do their loyalties lie? I mean, if you look at Powell, he was he was appointed by Trump, but he was kept by Biden. Um, and he's likely to, to go away after this administration either way. So if he is partisan, who do we think that he's partisan for and why? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Trump did yell at him quite a bit there at the end of his presidency. <laughs> Get a little I mean, angry. I, just, I, do, I do think it's human nature, right? I mean, I do think that no matter how apolitical he, I, I agree, I hope he's apolitical, but he also is, human nature is that he wants to, I'm presumably he would like to continue to become be, be Fed chair. I know he's not up for uh, a reappointment, I think, for a couple of years, right? So it's probably a year into the 26, I think. Yeah. And so, but I mean, I'm guessing if you asked him, it's like, I'd really like to stay. And so the question then becomes, does that play a role at all into, into the negotiations with the current administration? Or even does he even have discussions with Trump right now? I don't know. But, but it's way more than that. Because like, there's this idea that the Fed is completely independent. That doesn't make sense. Just like the idea that we can talk about economics and not talk about politics. It doesn't make sense because if the Fed knows that the coming in administration is going to spend two you know, trillion dollars a month, do you think that that's going to affect the way that he approaches monetary policy? Or if it is the opposite and they come in and they say, we are absolutely cutting the government, we're cutting spending, we're going to fire people. We're going to cut all these departments out. Do you think that's going to affect monetary policy? The government makes up 35% of our GDP. So at this point in the United States, to say that politics and economics are separated is stupid. And to say that the Fed can operate independently without any idea of the government, what they're doing or anything else is stupid. It doesn't make sense. It's 35% of the GDP. What they do right now, so let's look at, we talked about this, what, two weeks ago, Jay, where it was like out of the job creations, how much of the job creations were the government? It was astronomical. Between, job, between, between government and healthcare, it was over half of them. Exactly. The Fed knows this. So that goes into the viability 
if the think about what would happen, what would the Fed do if half the jobs in the United States disappeared that were created? That would so dramatically change our numbers. It would change everything about it. So if you go back, actually, it's an election thing, too, right? Going into an election, there's a lot of money spent always and jobs created leading up by the government leading up to election. Because guess what they're doing? They're boosting up their own numbers to try to get rehired. Got to boost those numbers up, right? Got to get those numbers up. So it's when you look at this politics, and that's why right now in the economy, during election seasons, business activity slows so far down because everybody is waiting to see. We need to know what's going on. We need to understand it. This is why the Fed also does it. Now, to say that the Fed is biased, meaning the Fed wants a Democrat or wants a Republican to win, that's different. Okay. Now, we would hope that the Fed doesn't think like that. But two, we also realize that these are people. So to assume that they do not have strong opinions on a president, for all we know, he may hate Trump. Ah, there's a decent chance. Trump's called them names, yelled, yelled at him quite a bit. Like, <laughs> exactly. They had a very bad relationship, right? So when you look at that, to think that that doesn't go into some kind of decision making, I just, how can you say that? That's to say that he's not human, right? So this whole idea that the Fed operates without thinking about politics or the government, that's like an economist saying that they don't take the government into account when looking at economic projections. You would never trust that economist, right, ever, because you're missing 35% of the whole economy. That is probably the difference in the last 15 years, just the government decisions, whether the economy has gone up, whether it's gone down, what has happened completely. So I don't even necessarily think that it's a bad thing to say that, because if they were so independent, they didn't look at it, they would make bad decisions. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. And I think the best point there, and I don't know if you made it or Kyle made it, um, but uh, if- Kyle if, didn't make it. I don't know what it was, but Kyle didn't make it. <laughs> probably I'm sure, me. I'm sure it was me. AJ. Probably me. Um, I mean, the best point there is that uh, that Powell probably wants to keep his job and he can do the calculus in his head on who's who's more likely to, to keep him around. And so, um, again, just like you said, AJ, even if it's not overt partisanship, even if it's not- even intended partisanship, there's going to be human emotion and and and, and he's, he's going to make decisions based on his own best interest, even if he tries not to. Don't forget the Fed's looking pretty far ahead too, right? So they're not making decisions to see what's going to happen next quarter of the crime. I mean, they're looking 12 to 18 months ahead. And so to, to Jay's point, I'm sorry, to AJ's point, because Jay wouldn't make the great point, AJ would, uh, then, um, you know, what's going to, who's going to be in charge in 18 months? Like what are the policies that the new, administration is going to bring in and what kind of legislation are they going to be pushing through Congress or, or supporting that's going to change things from the Fed's perspective. So yeah, I, 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 it's just interesting that how that. There's an interesting be. thought. Maybe he's just keeping rates high. So when Trump wins and Trump says you got to lower them, he just has a lot of runway to be able to lower and keep Trump happy because, you know, Trump's real estate, he's got to, he's got to boost those numbers, right? He's got to get those, uh, that, those, those interest rates down. So his business does well. That's what I'm saying though. He has to anticipate like that's got to factor in his decision. Like, I mean, that's not a completely out of whack thing. It's like, what, who is the, who is the new administration going to be and how are they going to do things differently? And if the likelihood is that one party is going to win over the other, and I'm not saying which one and their types of, you know, and it's also the Congress, right? Obviously Congress is the one that's actually making the laws, not, not the executive branch, but I don't know. I just think it all factors in, you know, fr- from our, from the real estate standpoint, most real estate investors, who I think are a big chunk of the listeners that we have here, they're focusing more on a particular subset of the economy, which is the middle class or the lower middle class, because there are our renters. And so we care more about how are they doing? Cause it affects us as real estate investors quite a bit. So if, if, if the economy is doing great for billionaires, that's great, but that's not who our tenants are, right? Our tenants are folks who are in the middle class and maybe even lower middle class. So that's why we tend to focus disproportionately on that on that front. And so even if there isn't a recession as a whole, if you're talking to a segment of the population, for example, I was reading that, you know, rents have gone up, right? 30% since pre-COVID, like 2024. I mean, that affects people. I don't know where they're getting the money for. You know, one of our big... One of our, I think our most popular video now, thanks, our most popular video has to do about people not being able, I don't know how people are affording their mortgages. And then you talk about how are people affording their rents? Because if rents have gone up 30% in the last four years, 
And let's say a third or even half of the people's income goes towards rent. That means they're spending an extra 10, 10%, give or take, back of the napkin calculation. Where's that coming from? I know their income hasn't gone up 10%. So where are they getting all this money? And so that's why we tend, I tend to focus anywhere on that segment of the population. So even though things may be going well overall in terms of averages, I do like to take a look at that specific number in terms of like, how is everybody else doing? Because if people start losing their jobs, guess what? They're not going to be able to pay the rent, which guess what? They've got eviction problems coming up, which I think is going to be the topic of our next uh, segment. Evictions in multifamily or even rentals, um, they we had a pause for a long time with COVID because of um, the rules that were set into place. And then since then, you've had rent go way up. Um, and this, you know, this is obviously uh, put a lot of people in a spot where they can't afford. This is obviously changed the underlying ability for landlords. Now they have more abilities to trade out tenants, to replace them with higher um, paying ones, which they need to do because of the fact that if they're not paying with um, everything that's gone up, like interest rates and inflation, landlords expenses have exploded. And a lot of them, frankly, are in trouble. So they are literally looking and saying, if you can't pay, of course, you got to get out. You, you like, And they don't have COVID now that says that they can't. So it's, you know, they're talking about a lot of different things, but that are driving it. But evictions have gone way, way up, um, shot, shot up. So that's really what we're looking at right now in the United States. And it's been more of this spring and uh, fall. And we really saw this in COVID. So when COVID came, the things that were the most controlled through COVID had the largest effect after COVID. And this really hit things like housing and rents bad because it messed the markets up so much and it changed the, it changed a lot of the game, right? It changed how we operated, what we could do, how we had to administer the cost associated on and on and on. There's all of these things that uh, when did it? And it's for um, you know for our renters and for the landlords. We've now entered into a new era post COVID, and it's, frankly, it's not one that anybody likes. Like a lot of people think that landlords are just making off like bandits because of high rents. That's not necessarily true. Landlords are struggling right now um, with rise in interest rates, and we know what's going on in the real estate market, right? transactions are down, things like it's You don't have landlords that are sitting here making off like bandits. And then at the same time, we've got renters that are getting crushed and they're getting crushed from all sides. They're getting crushed from inflation on their products. Did you guys see that video of the guy that was on, uh, he went onto his Amazon and he had ordered everything. He went and hit reorder from an order that he had made three years ago. Or no, sorry, not Amazon. It was um, Walmart. And he went back three years ago to an order that he'd made with groceries and he hit reorder. And it went from like $98 to 480 The exact same items. Now, right? in, in, in Walmart's defense, I believe part of that order was eight dozen eggs, which we oh all know. Have yes, <laughs> yes. It, it was half the orders. I mean, like... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but it, it, it shows the landscape that we're in and why all of a sudden rules, the landlords are trying to follow because like Mauricio said, the tenants, they don't, if tenants can't pay their bills, that is not good for landlords, right? That, I don't know why people think that landlords, people can't get a place to stay. And so landlords are making off like a bit. That's not how this works. They want demand to be sky high, right? And so they want that demand. They want people to pay the pill. They don't want to have to deal with fraud. They don't want, they want good paying tenants. We want diversity in the market where you have lower uh, housing, you have middle, you have upper, right? And that really changed in the last five years. Um, and it's put a lot of people in a really hard spot. And unfortunately, with with these elections coming, like I don't know what, it, what it's like in your area, but like right now, like our governor in Pennsylvania, Shapiro, uh, Jay's buddy, 
Um, he, you know, everyone seems to be putting. Was that, was, was, that, was, that a, was that a Jewish reference? Wow. You can take any reference you want. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, we, he's put like, he, like all they're doing is they want to, they want to get the, the vote of this, uh, you know, the younger, the youth generation, these, uh, you know, the, the masses. And so one of the things they're doing is they want to make it better for renters. It's, there's just been this rhetoric that like rents are too high and rents have been an issue. And so he just announced like he had 80 million towards funding eviction legal defenses. And like, it's it, like, it just seems to be like this year, especially with, with the politics and, and the elections all coming up and all these people need to need to get reelected and, um, that like we're we're not going to see any reprieve from these uh, election rules. I mean, let's be very clear. By the way, let's be very clear. These rents are not going down. I mean, they might very small, but like at the end of the day, rents about thirty percent. They're not. They might come down one percent or something, but they're not coming down. And so this idea that hey, when inflation starts getting into control, somehow everything's going to go back to normal. We this is the new baseline. Like the rents are what they are, and now the only way folks are really going to be able to handle that is for somehow the the wages to catch up which as we all know, typically doesn't work. Or, or the people just got to adjust too. Like it's like we have, like it's this, our, our younger generation and I'm part of that generation. You know, I sneak in the back end with millennials, Gen Zs. And like, There's no we, way you're part been, of the younger generation. Who are you kidding? Well, it's, I, you know, 1984, I sneak right in there. But um, 1984. Elder millennial, right, AJ? That's right. That's us, baby. But uh, we, we have this mentality where we don't, like once we have something, we don't want to give it up, right? That's why the people aren't saving. People are they they like the spending food uh, money on experience, like going out and and th and going on trips and stuff like that. And so once you've got that level of like, okay, this is the class apartment that I want to be in, like that can't change. Like this is this is I got to live there, and I'm living in an A class apartment. I'm just going to complain about how much it costs. I'm not going to move down to a B class. And like I feel like it's one of those things that like uh, like we've talked about this plenty of times recessions happen and people might just have to re recognize like we, when things get tough, you got to buckle down and you got to make some changes to your lifestyle. And they just haven't done that yet. Here's the other thing to consider. And, and this just makes things worse. A significant percentage of rentals are run by mom and pop landlords. People, I don't want to say us because I mean, we, we control, thousand some units, whatever, but there are plenty of mom and pop landlords out there that own one property or two or five. And for a lot of them, they manage their own rentals. They deal with the tenants directly. And when times are good for landlords, like I think back to like 2013 through 2018, um, where it was a great time to be a landlord, expenses were really low and incomes were, or rents were going up. Um, if I had tenants that were running into problems, because I was making plenty of money, it was a lot easier for me to be a little bit more lenient. Okay, so you're, you're having trouble making your payment. I'm not going to file uh, eviction on, on day three or day five. I'll give you an extra 10 days. No big deal. I understand. These days when a lot of my rentals are breaking even, some of them are losing money because of interest rates. I'm at risk of, 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 uh, of adjustable loans resetting and knowing that next year I could be losing money on some of these things. I'm probably going to be less. And again, when I say me, I'm, I'm talking more um, uh, the, the generic mom and pop landlord. They're going to be less likely to give a personal break to, to basically say, I understand, I'll work with you um, just because they're more financially stressed themselves. And that, that, basically makes it worse for everybody. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some percentage of these evictions that we're seeing are simply situations where in a better time, the landlord wouldn't yet be moving forward with an eviction um, and things would be eased a little bit. Well, think, think about it this way too. Like, let's just go through the process where we went through a time where you couldn't evict, right? Like, during COVID, you weren't allowed to evict people. So there was a backlog. People that you should have been evicted, they weren't getting evicted, they weren't getting processed. And then... Think about the courts. So once that gets opened up, once we, now we could do evictions, the courts didn't immediately want to go back to 2019 where we could just go back to the same rules. They kept more strict eviction rules and what it took to evict people. And then, but think about like they had processes and people hired in a whole funnel, as we like to say, of how to process evictions based off of 2019 still. So like one of, like one of the process things that we're having in somewhere like Houston, like even when you do process an eviction, 
you need it's it's like a rule you have to have the constable come out to a victim like we can't just go knock on the door and and kick them out right like we can't say like here's your eviction it processed legally you got to get out and like show up with a gun on her hip um like you can't do that you have to actually get the constable well the constable there's too many evictions that have, that have processed all at once because there was this backlog the constable gets backlogged so now there's all these evictions that have processed they're still evictions but the people haven't left yet because the constable hasn't come around so the, these people are just they're getting more brazen it used to be like no one would fight evictions because they knew there's no point in spending money fighting evictions you're just going to lose so no one would fight evictions they would just leave well now people are fighting it so it's this snowball effect where people are fighting it because they know they can they can get leniency they could stay longer we don't have enough people to actually process evictions we don't have enough judges to go through the backlog and it's just become a big big disaster so i i don't think it's necessarily like like just one thing that it, like we're saying like evictions like it, we could pinpoint it on one thing i think it's just a litany of errors that they've gone through and that like it's uh we're not necessarily having more people evict per month but it's just this whole backlog of people are getting evicted and we can't actually kick them out and how did, how does that going to work by the way cuz obviously once you get evicted even if you know, if it takes a while that's that's going on your permanent record so i mean how are these guys going to start getting rents the next time around like how how what i mean i'm, I'm serious like so i got evicted great fraud I, I told you, man, they, 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 it's fraud now. Like the, the amount of fraud that we're catching is uh, like off the charts. Like we, we, like our property management company, they're like third generation property managers. Their family has been doing this for you know, like 50 years or something. They said, this is the most fraud that they've ever seen in their lifetime of, of people making fraudulent and like crafty fraud too, like full blown, like separate identities and stuff going on. Like it's like, they're, they're getting very, and it's like, because we, we always catch up, right? It's like cat and mouse. Like, okay, you figure out what the new fraud of the day is and how are we going to catch that? And like, you, you, ha you have to do all those things and you hope not too many of them get slip, slip between the cracks before you figure out how to catch them. And they're just getting getting worse and worse. And but like what percentage of them are doing that? I mean, it, let, I mean, I mean, look, you know, let's just take specific stats. I mean, there's 8,000 evictions, I think, in Phoenix, right? So there's 8,000 people who are going to go through. By now, it's already July. So by now, there, let's say 8,000 people are evicted. Some percentage of those 8,000, what, 10% are doing fraud? I mean, but whatever the percentage is. There, there's another form of, of basically hiding it that uh, you may not call fraud. Maybe it is fraud. I mean, depending on how you look at it. But let's say, again, talk about mom and pop landlords who own single family houses. Uh, most of them, when they evict, it's not going on anybody's permanent record because they don't have, they don't report to the credit bureaus. Um, my single families, if I ever have to evict somebody, I don't, I don't have any place to report it to. So I don't, if those people then go and apply for another rental somewhere, and instead of saying Jay was my landlord, so the, the landlord can call me and I can say, yeah, I evicted the guy. He didn't pay. It was horrible. If he says, yeah, I was living with my mom for the last year. Um, or I got I divorced. With Mike, my buddy, Mike, he's a, he's a landlord. Exactly. Um, and so I'll have no way of knowing that they were evicted. So of those 8,000, there's probably a significant, and I don't know what the numbers are, but there's probably a significant number that it doesn't get reported and they have the ability to lie and, and are they going to get caught? Probably not. Well, you know, what's making a big res resurgence now is that cash for keys, right? Like that's like, that's a big thing. Cause you know, like you could spot when you've been had, like it's, it's a, it, like you have all your checks, your background checks, your calls, all those things. And then all of a sudden, like just like one or two things happen and you're like, damn it, like these guys got me. Like you, they, you know they're a professional tenant and you know like they're just gonna ring you for as much as they can. And at that point, like people are saying, it's worth it to me to say, listen, if you're out in one week, broom swept, I'll give you a thousand dollars, just move on. And like, like some people will go even more, like 1,500, to, like because they know they're gonna spend four times that much and they're gonna lose double that in rents over the time of trying to get these people out. So they're just like, and, and it's, it's an it's a very controversial thing, obviously, because it's good for the business owner at that time, but like it just perpetuates this thing where like they're just going to move on to the next person and they're going to do it to them and they're going to move on to the next person to do it to them and like it's kind of like a karma thing, like you know it's going to come back to you, right? Like if that's what you're doing. So, but it's like it's it's something that's become a real 
a real prevalent thing, even in these these states that before, like you used to be able to just kick people out and move on. You know, I think one of the biggest things we're in California or I'm in California right now. Mauricio is supposed to live here, but he didn't want to hang out with me. Um, but I um, we would, we're down here. I'm talking with a, a company um, that I own out of here. One of our, my partners in the company is a developer. And he was telling me that they went to a site here in California. They went to develop it. And there's some oversight committee, something called NOAA or NOA. They made some stupid acronym. Um, and the they what they have to do is they have to do a full checkup on the land. It cost him uh, $200,000 on the site before they can even put it in for approvals, anything else, right? They get on the ground and, and, the, and his words, not mine, a bunch of hippies crawl around and look at ground squirrels and things like that. And if they determine that something's living in the ground, not up it, they got to do all of this stuff, right? And this is the only thing that it goes towards. They just go look at the ground. They they track it. They study it. If there's something living, you have to do regulation, blah, 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 blah. You cannot even start the development process. You can't get approvals, nothing, until this is done on every single piece of land. And uh, two, if they don't like it, if the ground squirrels are living in and there's a lot of them and they're cute, you don't get it approved, right? So he was like, uh, we buy this land, then we're 200 plus thousand dollars into it. And we don't even know if we can get it approved. So he's like, the risk that we will even take on or do here to get developed, he's like, it's, it's so expensive. But we don't. We're, we got to take on these costs before we can even know that we can touch the land and do it. So he's like, the process we go through here before we'll even get close to it is, you know, wild because we know the likelihood of us even getting it approved. Well, that's really high up here in the state. And I don't know if you guys have seen the um, so uh, the um, uh, study of housing economics. Uh, they did a. Uh, research study over time and found the average cost of uh, regulation and applying for new homes. And this is multifamily, um, but it's bit, uh, or excuse me, not multifamily, single family house. And right now in the United States, it's ninety three thousand dollars is the average in the United States. Uh, that's what goes into it. That's what the study found. Everybody, you can go look at that study. Um, it's done. It was done on May 5th, 2021, special study for housing economics. Uh, Paul Amrath, PhD, Economic and Housing Policy, the National Association of Home Builders. They put it up. Um, and so you look at this and you go, you want, okay, the, what is the average cost of a home in the United States? And the average cost associated with building that home through from regulation. This includes land that you have to give up. This includes I have to go through is $98,000. Um, we have such massive holding cost. Uh, anybody that's a developer knows the risk to get this out of the ground. And then you go into places like California and it's way more and way more risk. And this causes a huge inventory problem. It, 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 it really makes cost go up. The only way that we can affect demand is by adding supply and housing. It doesn't matter what governments do. Mauricio made the point, it's not going down. Because it's not, unless we have a massive glut of inventory, which is not in process. The inventory doesn't exist right now. It's not going through. Nobody's developing it. Um, those prices aren't aren't going to come down. And so when you when we look at this problem, when we're looking at what Kyle's talking about between the operations to run and rent, the fraud that's going on, the new supply that needs to come out, especially in lower income. It's the main problem that we have, right? But the cost associated with putting out lower income doesn't make sense. You can't do it. I can't build lower income housing and charge for lower income prices and break even. You can't put product out of the ground anymore, charge it. It doesn't work. That ended, right, in the early 2000s. And since then, the price has gone up. The average price from 2011 went from 60000 to almost 100000 per home in just the regulation part. Uh, that's just since 2011. That was obviously a fraction way less than the amount of regulations that's going down. So this is not a problem that's going away. There's no mechanism for this to be changed. So the government can't regulate 
or put in policy to just make prices drop. In fact, it's opposite. The more that they try, like in California, the more pricing goes up. Uh, and so this isn't the first time we're going to see this problem. And I think this eviction process is a resetting for landlords. And I don't think it will continue at this level, but the pricing problem will exist. That's not going to change. It's going to be a problem for years to come. Unless we have incomes that dramatically rise, it's not going to happen. And, and don't forget that, I mean, the broader trend is that it is coming down. I mean, the, the, Wall, the Wall Street Journal article specifically was really honing in on specific cities. I think it was 10 out of 33, but some, I mean, the other 23 are doing okay. So if you look at the broader you know, evictions overall, 33 of these cities is actually is coming down. But yeah, it's, it, it's, rents are definitely not coming down. And this is going to continue to be an issue. And like I said, I don't know how people are, I don't know how they're going to do it. I just don't know. I just, I honestly don't know where they're yeah, going evictions in some states went down a lot. Like Delaware dropped 34%. Um, you have Missouri down 20%. New Mexico is down 14%. Virginia was down 15%. While other states like Ohio was up, you know, almost 40%. Gainesville, Florida was almost 50%. Evictions went up 50%, right? Now, uh, so we are seeing it, but the broad base, particularly the Sun Belt, is where we're seeing the most evictions. And uh, um, I think it, that has to probably to do with policy and a whole bunch of other things. But you're right. The ev evictions aside, rent is not, that's not changing. All right. Amen to that. Let's finish this off, guys. I know. So we finally, we couldn't go through a full episode without discussing a bit of the elephant in the room. That's Biden suspending his re-election campaign. Jay really didn't want to talk about this. He's very anti-politics, apparently. But He doesn't like I talking feel, about politics at all. Yeah, so, but uh, AJ overruled him. He's he's higher in the, in the hierarchy on this podcast. So um, we are going to talk about it just a little bit. But we, uh, just to keep Jay happy, because he gets grumpy when we talk politics, so um, we're going to make sure this is very relevant to us as investors. So, Mauricio, why don't you lead us off by talking to us about how this could change things in the economy and real estate by Biden stepping down? Fuck, I don't know. I mean, you know, like I love how Jay like like Jay doesn't want to talk politics, but we spent like an hour before this episode talking politics. And then my my WhatsApp all weekend was just blow. Like I literally couldn't I was scrolling through. I couldn't keep up. I was only scrolling through all of the politics and and conspiracy theories and like, you know, I don't, I don't and, mind wasting the time of my friends. I'm not going to waste the time of my listeners. I mean, I, I don't, you know, you know, I, I'm fascinated to see how it's going to work out. I mean, I, I thought you, I thought we were going to discuss, you know, how this is all going to work out in terms of how, how does it work out? So in the transfer, it does. I yeah. The transfer of power. This is the thing I was going to talk about. Cause I mean, I'm not a constitutional attorney or anything like that. That's one of the biggest mistakes people always think it's like every attorney is, is, is all knowing about all legal stuff. So I'm not a constitutional attorney, but um, you know, in, ter in terms, I mean, Jay, Jay brought this up great in one of our WhatsApp. It's like, you know, everybody's assuming that Kamala, I think is her name uh, is the presumptive nominee. And I guess she is, but you know, the, the way it works is she still needs to be nom officially nominated, right? She has not become a not now over the last 24, 48 hours. It sounds like all of the relevant parties are starting to line up to Jay's point. He said that was going to happen. So give you credit, Jay, like you were literally talking about this over the weekend. It sounds like the rank and file other than one prominent person, but everybody else is kind of lining up, you know, in, in favor of Kamala. But what, what's interesting, and I know our listeners know this, but it's, it's, it's fascinating to me to, to realize that most people don't realize and again, our listeners do, but most don't realize that we actually don't directly, you know, elect our, our, our president, right? Like we don't actually elect who's going to be elected a president. Um, and that's how you get to scenarios where last, you know, two, eight years ago, you had a, the majority of people voting for Hillary Clinton, yet, you know, Trump won because we don't directly, you know, we don't directly vote for the president. We vote for delegates, right? So when we do the, the initial process, we vote for delegates and then the delegates, who are pledged to a particular candidate will just as a formality, usually as a formality, they will, they will, they will elect the candidate at the convention. Well, obviously this is a unique situation. It has happened before. It's not completely unique, but there are basically delegates now that have been elected and those delegates will now decide who's going to be the nominee. And so right now, from what everything I've read, there doesn't seem to be a challenge to the Kamala Harris, you know, nomination. And so if she's the only one that's going to go to the convention, then all of the delegates that have been elected, which by the way, there are, 
4,500 delegates, just over 4,500 delegates, 3,700 of those have been actually, you know, those are pledged, those have been elected by the people to go represent them. And then there's something called super delegates, which are usually, you know, the people who are in charge. So sort of, you know, the former governors or the governors, the former presidents, the speaker of the house, those are all kind of super delegates, but they're just going to vote. Like there's going to be a, a vote at the convention. And so if Kamala Harris is the only nominee, then she's going to get all the votes for the delegates. But if somebody steps up, and challenges her, which we don't know if that's going to happen or not. It sounds like some may not, but if there is a challenge, then it's just going to be a straight up vote. Uh, but you do need a majority of the delegates. Uh, and even though they're all pledged to Biden, now they're free to, to vote, who, legally free to vote who, from a legal perspective, they're free to vote who, for whoever they want. So what usually happens, and I think it's already happened, is there's a lot of lobbying, right? A lot of a lot of campaigning now, but not to the American people, but to those delegates, because those delegates are now going to be, those are the guys that have the votes. And they're just like fanatical, I, I call them fanatical organizers. I mean, they're people like you and me who are really into politics that are usually grassroots organizers and they're fanatical about Trump or fanatical about Biden or fanatical about whatever party you're looking at. And uh, right now, I think 99 or 98 and a half percent of the delegates are Biden people, right? But they don't, there's, there's no legal obligation for them to actually vote for any particular candidate. So you've got to get their votes. So unless somebody else throws their hat in the ring, which at this point anyway, as the recording at the time of recording doesn't seem that it's going to happen, then they're going to get to a convention. There's going to be one nominee, which is going to be Kamala, and she's obviously going to get a majority of the votes. And if that happens, then she's going to be the the next uh, the nominee for the Democratic Party. And well, she already came out yesterday, like that she locked it up. Apparently, she's talking to all these delegates behind doors. They're already pledging to her, and she's already said that she's looking forward to accepting the party nomination. So according to her, it's already a done deal. Yeah, but again, these are plays. These are not legally binding. They, it's just like it's like a you know, it's like a college recruit, right? You're a football player or a hockey player to to use your terminology, Kyle. You're a hockey player. You pledge to go play for the University of Michigan. You can wake up the the night before and say, you know what? Screw that. I'm going to Cal. Does Cal have a hockey team? <laughs> I don't think so. That, <laughs> I'm sure they have a club team or something. But. Yeah, I, I and so just to just and and you pointed out earlier that I predicted this. Let me make it clear. I'm I'm not a fan of of Kamala. I didn't. I wasn't hoping she would be picked. I, I can think of about 50 people in both parties I would rather have before her. But that said, uh, I think the 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 calculus here on the Dem side was pretty obvious. Um, you needed to get somebody. Um, that they were going to unify behind as quickly as possible. I think we're like 105 days away from from the election. And the longer you wait to unify behind a candidate, um, the more infighting you have, the harder it's going to be once you do unify behind that candidate. So um, I'm, I also suspect that part of the negotiations for for Biden stepping down, I don't want to get political, but is was that she was going to take over. So I, 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 th I thought it was a, a pretty obvious choice, um, whether it's the best choice or not. I'll, I'll, I'll let the voters decide that. But it just seemed like that was the obvious choice the voters don't get to decide that <laughs> they don't that, get to decide. i'm sorry i'll, I'll let the yeah. I, I correct it, it you're absolutely right i didn't mean it that way and i was wrong so so another important thing which i think is is not to be overlooked and it's it, it's money right like who has the most money for election and so from a legal from a legal perspective because it's a biden harris ticket any monies that were raised for the Biden campaign now belongs to Kamala Harris. So I don't know what, I, you, Kyle, you probably have the number, but there's a war chest that Joe Biden has. That's going to get transferred over to Kamala Harris. If some somebody else pops in, like I, I think Gavin Newsom's already actually endorsed she he wouldn't come in. But if like if Michelle Obama or uh, Joe Munchen, I think is the other potential that could pop in, they're going to have to raise money from scratch. They're going to have to start from day one and start raising money. And that's just for, it's, it's, there's so little time between now and the convention that from a practical standpoint, logistical, the system is almost like it's almost rigged to the point where it really makes it impractical unless you're somebody like an Obama, a big name that you can just go raise $50 million over the weekend. It makes it really difficult for a new candidate to just pop in and go compete with the war chest that the, the Biden-Harris now, Harris question mark, uh, has in the war chest. I, I I do hate though that everyone keeps putting oh it's it's so sh such a short amount of time to the election we have such a short amount of time to the election like have we looked at these other countries like we are like the only country that takes like a full year to do the the election process like there's like even Canada like they could Canada the UK like they can call elections whenever they want they just yeah, but like, they have like five people the UK has ten voters Canada has twelve voters I mean it's not a big deal. 
But the point, the point is, is that like, they always have to be ready for an election. And then it's a couple months. Like, it's literally like we have like three months, like other countries do full elections in those times. And yet we're acting like, oh my God, we don't have enough time to like, just find these kids. We don't like, we can't do That's this. That's because we have 50 states. We have 50 different countries within our country that all have to decide. If any of those other countries were important to the world, then they would spend more time getting their elections right. <laughs> it was a joke. It was a joke. Hey, Jay's we're, just we're saying all what we're all thinking. America. America. <laughs> Those what well, well, those two people who are li- listening from Abu Dhabi right now they they just tuned out Jay. <laughs> we all He's just saying what we're all thinking. Top, top, what countries are our top listeners? Were they like you know Scandinavian countries? <laughs> okay, I think. Uh, do I do I need Secret Service protection? Take it back, Jay. Take it back. <laughs> I I wouldn't take Secret Service protection, Jay. That's not a good idea. <laughs> By the way, I want, can I make a confession too? Because you know, since we're talking politics, I'm not a fan of either either one of them. And uh, I, I, meant, I made a comment to Jay over the weekend about RFK Jr. But like, I literally went on his website to look at his platform. Like, fuck, let, let me look at this guy's platform. And you know, because everybody talks about JFK Jr. and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I looked at his platform of like of the 20 things that are on there. I'm like, I, I agree with two of them or three of them. And so I was like, oh crap, I really would have loved to have to have considered him as a as a viable candidate, but. Um, I don't know. I, he, it'll be by the way. By, by the way, that is another point that I want to bring up. Most of the elections that I've seen over the like, remember when the Clinton when Clinton got elected or when Bush like, there's always that third party candidate that really nobody talks about, but really influences the outcome of the of the candidate. And so it's interesting to see where RFK's votes are going to be coming from because I've seen polls from both ways that they're pulling more from Democrats or they're pulling more from Republicans. But he has a non-zero percentage it's not like he's polling at two percent or three percent he's polling at 10 12 percent and maybe at the end of the day that's going to end up being five or six percent but that's enough to swing an election and so the question becomes where are those votes coming from who's voting for rfk that otherwise would have voted for trump or biden in addition to jay i'm sorry aj that you mentioned i think last week because uh, i didn't listen to the show uh just turn out right like who's going to turn out so so to, to actually uh and I'm sure you guys will drive it away from this direction when I'm done talking. But for a moment, let's steer it towards how does this impact us as real estate investors? Um, I did a little bit of research. It's hard really to figure out what Kamala does or believes. She's been pretty behind the scenes for the last four years, and we don't have to get into that. But um, it, it's really hard to kind of see where her uh, where her policies kind of lie and her beliefs and opinions. We know lie. she's very pro-choice. That's She's very it. for a while. With respect to, to obviously, we, we the know context. Something. Respect to the context. Yes, with respect to, to real estate. And one thing I did find, um, and I suspect that a lot of her um, a lot of her opinions and, and uh, policy is going to fall in line with the, the 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 democratic policy and platform, which is uh, anti discrimination um and um and and ending homelessness and supporting renters and all those things but the one place that i noticed that she she has a record that might be really good for investors is specifically around um community development and affordable housing so apparently she got behind a very large uh package uh uh, uh year or two ago um, for basically increasing grants and funding by five to $10 billion. I don't remember the exact number um, for, for affording house, uh, 40 affordable housing development. Um, and so if that is her preferred option for trying to bring down housing prices and, and impact homelessness and, and uh, get more people in houses um, that could be good for developers. So I, I suspect she's big be- on the rate caps on rent caps. She's a huge proponent. Yeah. Well, she's California, right? Like that's like, she came from California. Like that's like, she wasn't necessarily the one making the policies, but like that's where she's from. And it also scares me. If you look at this list of possible VP candidates, uh, like, well, let's do like, I don't know how quickly you could do this, AJ, but like the list you had from evictions where they're, they're having the biggest issues with evictions because mainly because the laws are very tenant friendly. A lot of those, those, uh, those are the ones that are, you know, Shapiro, it's the guy from uh, Arizona. 
Um, like th these are the people who are leading candidates to be VP picks and they've been known to be very tenant friendly. So uh, the fact that she's from California, the fact that VP pick might be from one of these states that are tenant friendly with uh, with their their policies. I mean, Let, I, it scares me a little. Let's not let's not get away. Let's not kid ourselves. The, the VP is not going to be who cares whether they're tenant friendly or not. They're going to care about what state are they from, one of those swing states, and are they going to turn the swing states in their favor? And, and, and let's be honest, I don't think any of this really matters. I mean, it's, it's good talking points for the, for the Democrats who want to appeal to their base. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the president doesn't pass – for the most part, legislation. Um, they have to, they can, they can encourage bills and the, but those bills have to be passed by the house and, and the Senate. And regardless of what the election ends up being in November, regardless of whether it's a split Congress or a Republican Congress or a democratic Congress, uh, at the end of the day, most, I don't know if most is the right word, a very high percentage of, uh, Congress people, uh, are invested in real estate. And so I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to see legislation coming out of Congress that has a significant negative impact on um, on real estate investors, regardless of, of who the president ends up being. Now, it's very possible that with with Trump, because he's a real estate uh, developer and he probably has a lot of real estate developer friends, um, we could see a lot more pro real estate investor legislation come out, but I don't expect. Well, we talked about like regulation and I think that's the, so there's a couple things because like we were talking, I was just talking about how he was talking about how interest, um, interest rates over regulation. It's actually far more important. He was like to get rid of regulation than it is interest if you, you want to move things. So I think, and I think you're exactly right. Where we're going to see is then is when they address and put forth their economic policy and plan, they're going to have key issues that they're going to be going down to the Democrats and like forcing them like, you guys get this done so I look good, right? So the party looks good because if we don't do this, we have failed promises, we get out of office. And a lot of that, I think that will be affecting investors, period, is going to be doing like how they're going to approach um, everything from uh, um, policy surrounding trade that that will have a big effect. This has a huge effect on development. So when you look at Trump, Trump, uh, some of the Trump stuff that he did was not good for us in development at all. So his his tariffs and what he did really hurt us on steel prices. Now that may not sound like a big deal, but when you're talking about it like a developer to me. This could be the difference in 15% gross cost, which could be the difference of a project even being able to work or not. And so that, that could tip me over. You can actually put a developer underwater, which actually happened during COVID and some of these things when we had these cost spikes. So when you look at trades, tariffs, right, those things will affect. So it, for me, if I'm a developer looking at the cost of raw materials that are coming from other countries, you know, Kamala may have a actually better position than Trump in those issues because she may say, let's get rid of tariffs. Let's open the borders. Right. Let's really do free trade. And we may get more product moving along. Now, Trump may go, though, we want way we want to cut red tape like we're going to cut red tape. We want houses to be built. Let's really put regulation in here. Let's or, or let's get rid of regulation. Excuse me. And let's turn uh, wipe out regulation and make it more friendly for developers. And these things end up affecting inventory. So if we didn't have our uh, 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 spike in cost, which we've seen over the last three years, which wasn't just government, it was obviously due to inflation, which was government caused, but it also had to do with COVID and the barriers of entry that happened to COVID. That dramatically affected though supply because it, we saw cost go from you're, you're talking $40 a square foot to 100 in my industry. Apartments saw the same thing. All of a sudden, the amount of inventory you're putting out, that really goes down. And that affects rents that we have. So when I'm looking at the administrations, it's not so much on whether they're going to put a rent cap, right? And whether they do, because I think Jay's exactly right. First of all, they're not going to get that kind of stuff passed. It'll be the second uh, effects associated with our business. Those effects will be regulation. Those effects will be their economic policies, trade, 
which will have a dramatic effect though on how our um, overall landscape, supply, demand, renters, uh, those kind of things will play out for us. And both sides have things that are good and bad. It's very clear, right? Uh, Trump's uh, tariff wars are going to be bad for product and supply and cost with some of those things, particularly uh, products that we source completely out of the United States, right? Where you have other things like regulation, tenant-friendly laws, protectionism uh, for tenant uh, uh, for tenants that are going to be pushed out. That may not be on the other side. So when I'm looking at the change in administrations, I'm saying, all right, we have uh, Biden to Kamala. What is their stance that is going to be different? So if we're getting Kamala, not Biden, what is the difference in their stance that may actually affect us versus a Biden and Trump? That's really what I'm looking at to yeah. try to understand how a new administration. I, I think a, may a bigger us. issue, or, or an equally as big issue, is simply that um, if we get well, we're going to get one side or the other in office. Um, it's going to encourage the states that support that side. So if if Kamala gets elected, then it'll be the blue states. If Trump gets elected, it'll be the red states. It's going to encourage those states um, to push regulation and legislation uh, that is in agreement with the White House. And so if, if Kamala gets elected, there's there's a much better chance that we see blue states pushing more rent control and, and, um, and tenant rights. If Trump gets elected, there's more chance uh, that we see the red states double down on the opposite of those things, or maybe even see some blue states shy away from those things. Because typically speaking, um, to some degree where the the, the 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 executive branch goes, the states are going to go as well, and so that could that could be a bigger impact than whatever that candidate's personal opinion or, or policy might be. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can necessarily count out Trump as far as he is a real estate investor himself, right? So I don't think he's going to do too much against us as real estate investors. He wants his business to thrive as as well, so that's a factor in. And then don't don't count out uh, Vance, his uh, his VP pick too. Uh, former venture venture capitalist. So if you want to talk about something like Mauricio's with uh, raising money and stuff like that, um, he's probably going to be have a little pet projects in there too. So um, yeah, it's uh, they're all things you got to consider. But unfortunately, we can't just pick presidents based off of just how they're going to affect our business as well. There's other th- factors like we have to live in this country for another uh, hopefully 50 years. Um, and then our kids as well after and what kind of country are we doing after that so just make enough money to where it doesn't matter kyle that's true we'll start our own country right what's it seasteading isn't that what it's called we'll just uh we'll, we'll create our own country we'll go off we already have the planes if we bring aj so. um all right is that enough politics for you jay you, you good i'm good see that, that i thought that was beneficial to us as investors and i'm okay talking about politics in that that respect okay so we can wrap this up ed Top 10 conspiracy theories. Is that what we're doing? Actually, you know what? That's, that's too bad. I should have done that, um, but I don't. I have a different one. That was, uh, that was a missed opportunity. I'm sorry. Okay, so let, let's, let's real quick, let's do the game first. Do you guys believe that, um, that there are UFOs? Not whether there's life out there, but do we actually, the, the things that we identify as UFOs um, visiting Earth, like, do you think those, those are real? I'm on the fence. Seriously, Jay, I'm on the fence. Like I used to be a complete no, but now I'm like, I guess who am I to say no? Maybe. But I'm like, why don't we have better pictures of it? I'm on the fence. Well, I thought the government came out and basically like said, like, yeah, we have evidence of UFOs. UFOs, yes. Sorry. If they're aliens or not, that's different. So UFOs, unidentified flying objects, absolutely. There's weird stuff. Are they other country? But if they're aliens or not, that's what I mean. I'm on the fence. More towards yes. More towards yes. More towards yes. Mauricio, is that so? This is so. What's the I, I, what's the question? Are there aliens? J- Jay's are, taking over the, the game at the end. Wait, how do we go from top ten conspir- How do we go from top ten conspiracies <laughs> to, to from cop politics for real estate? To are are we? Do we have aliens? The number gonna, one wait, conspiracy unless, theory. Wait, wait, I guess. The, are the aliens going to interrupt like the the supply and demand of housing? Is that the connection? No, we're done. The, the podcast is over. We're doing the fun oh. shit at the end right now. Oh, and okay. Jay wanted to, 
He wanted to skip over the top Keep 10, up. and then we're going to do the top 10. We're going to do this first and then the top 10, and he wanted I to take not, over. Yeah, I do not. I am not in the camp of any aliens. I, uh, UFOs, sure. Unidentified flying objects all day long. Uh, aliens, no. That's how you know he's an alien. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm always just like, it, it's tough for you to believe there are aliens, but also if you just look at the statistically, like I was a physics major and like, yeah, I had to take astronomy classes and just statistically that we are the only uh, no, intelligent that, 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 life wait, 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 in the entire universe. That's, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about whether there are is life in a different planet in somewhere out there. We're not, I'm saying, are they, have they come here and we haven't figured who they are? That's a different question. Like, are you saying that there's people, there's aliens that have come within the, I mean, we have pretty good radius now on, on around the world with our telescope. Are you telling that there are aliens that have arrived on the planet and we don't know about them? When the Air Force is well, flying around and they say, I saw something weird, these weird lights, I, I, it, it's technology that I don't believe that we have. Do you believe that what they're seeing is, is aliens and UFOs? I, I don't understand. And I don't understand enough about it, but I don't understand how when they lose it from their vantage point that some other satellite hasn't like there, we have satellites everywhere. So n nobody else can pick up this thing. Like, where did it go? Where, I mean, w w I don't understand that part. Like how does somebody approach the world when we have thousands and thousands of satellites and just somehow they're, they're invisible. Right, I've, I've been drinking and this is, where they can't be I've been drinking enough to have this conversation or I need to be doing something other than drinking to be having this conversation. But <laughs> it's, <laughs> this, this is, this is a tough one. I don't think, I think we just move on to the top 10. What do you think, AJ? Fine, can we, as long as Jay answers it, I got Jay. I got to hear your answer. I'll, I'll, def I'll definitely right answer. I'll definitely uh, answer it. But I think we, at some point we should have like a segment. I know at some we we had talked about this before, and I said no. I I uh, I will admit that was a bad decision. At some point we should have a segment on things like this. Um, I'm going to go with Mauricio on this. Uh, I so one, I believe there's certainly life elsewhere. Two, I believe there are these UFOs that can't be explained. Um, but three, um, I am highly, highly, highly leaning towards the fact that they are not aliens uh, hanging out and visiting us these days. Not a hundred percent. Not a hundred percent. In fact, I'm, 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 I, I, I would have been a hundred percent, eh, twenty years ago. But there's enough weird stuff that the government kind of is insinuating and saying um, that, I don't know, there's, it, there's doubt is creeping in. But I'm still mostly thinking it's not. All right. We will, let's, do, let's do a conspiracy theory segment. We used to do it as part of our uh, predictions episode, but um, maybe we'll bring something like that back. All right. Top 10. Um, this comes from going back to elections. Um, honestly, I, I know it's a bit of the, the right, right wing is, is really talking about like, oh, it's unfair how Kamala is just going to get like, uh, unelected and she's going to be the, uh, the candidate. Um, I echo that a little bit just because this is my first election I'm going to be able to vote for. And so if we had had a, a democratic primary um, like I would have, I would have been able to be, be part of the whole process. You know what I mean? Like even the whole Trump thing, he was kind of just, it just was Trump and, uh, like, and it was just Biden. Like there was no real, like, okay, let's, let's, let's duke it out. Let's, let's vote for our, uh, our primary candidates. And I feel like I, I just wanted to experience that. But anyway. So who did you vote for in the primary, Kyle? What's that? who did you vote for in the primary? There wasn't a primary. There was no. Well, I, okay. I guess technically Biden. There was somebody else, but like, yeah, like I didn't go. You didn't write um, me in? No, Ashley wrote in because I, I still had to do like the whole process. Like I've never done it before. Right. So I got to like pick like which, which place I'm registering at and do all those things. And like, it, like I, I didn't decide to go through it. Um, okay. <laughs> voted, voting. He gets, a, he becomes an American citizen. He gets the greatest right granted to every American citizen. And it was just, nah, it's too much work. Okay, so you, you're like you're you're acting like the greatest right to vote for Biden or some person I've never heard before. Like, no, the right is when I get to actually vote in the actual election where my vote's going to matter. That's 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 the right is when you, every single vote matters. It doesn't matter if you're Elon Musk or you're some little speck like uh, Jay Scott. Then like your votes both matter the same amount. That's the that's the American thing. Not lie, anyway, that, that hurt a little bit. Well, everyone's a spec compared to Elon Musk. Let's let's be honest. Uh, okay, so I went with the top ten celebrities American would would like to see run for president. 
So if it was only celebrities, like you only get to pick from celebrities, no actual politicians, the top 10 people that were picked. Taylor Swift. So I want you to throw Taylor some Swift. numbers Taylor and I'll tell you names Taylor Taylor Swift. Right. Is, is Ronald Taylor Reagan Swift. a celebrity or a, poli- or a politician? DJ, stop. We're, we're, let's try and keep this on the rails. AJ, I heard you say The Rock. Obviously, he's my number one pick. I've made it very evident. I've mentioned it multiple times. I know he's a listener and he's yet to say, but I would have loved him. He is number two on the list. Number two number most two? popular oh, don't uh, tell American. Me it's Taylor Swift. <laughs> Kyle's no. definitely a Swifty. Oh, thank goodness. Thank Taylor, goodness, Taylor, Taylor Swift is actually not on the list. I, I, is this your personal list, or is this like? Nope, nope. This was a this is a survey of two thousand Americans uh, commissioned by Study Finds. So, top of my list is Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban snuck in number ten. Oof, that's it. Tucker is Tucker Carlson considered a candidate here. Tucker Carlson's not on the list. Elon Musk number nine. Bill Gates number eight. Matthew McConaughey, number seven. I just hear him talk. I mean, I mean, he's yeah, and he's like a uh, a lot of people like him too, right? Because he's like an obvious Republican, but he's like uh, Arnie's got to be in there somewhere. So a lot of people like Matthew McConaughey though, because he's like obviously he's a Republican, but he's very uh, like reasonable on the whole guns and stuff, and like he he seems very moderate. Oprah Winfrey, number six. George Clooney, number five. George Clooney could debatably be the person who like that was the that was the death knell for uh, for Biden. Right. He came out and said Biden needs to step down. And it was what, like a week later he was gone. Um, Number four, (laughs) I questioned this because we already went through the people with the age. But number four is Clint Eastwood. I don't know how old Clint Eastwood is, but he's he's getting up there now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, but apparently we like old old white guys still. Number three, Tom Hanks. I think that would be a great pick as well. We already said number two is The Rock, and number one, any guesses? It's a it's a movie star. I'll throw. I'll give you a guess. I'll give you a hope. Brad Pitt, Adam Sandler, Denzel Washington, number one. Oh, that's random. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody loves Denzel. I, not as president, he, but... he would get shit done, right? Like, yeah. But he's, he's, he's I think he's he's pretty moderate. Like if you listen to him, things like that. I think he the, que- the question I have though, the question I have is if Jay Scott was considered a celebrity, would he be on that list? Absolutely. Ooh. No doubt. No In doubt. Sarasota, maybe. Who so on that list, who would you guys vote for? Jay. I told you Mark Cuban's number one. Okay. Mauricio. None of those guys. <laughs> Matthew <laughs> McConaughey. So I I obviously went into this saying the rock, but Matthew McConaughey is actually kind of tuned into politics and stuff, so I think he would be a great pick. I think so, too. Mauricio's so just going to roll his <laughs> eyes and look the other way. <laughs> hey, you look like it's crazy. How many celebrities have we gone into I don't politics? Know why Taylor Swift wouldn't be just as qualified as all those 10 actors. Because she, she's very, she's actually like, uh, like, there's a lot of Taylor Swift goes on in my house with uh, my two daughters and my wife is a bit of a Swifty too. Um, and I, I do know that Taylor Swift is very like non-political. She tries to be non-political. She doesn't want to be, um, how if you is watch Arnold her documentary. Schwarzenegger not on that line? Not that I'm, how is, Ar- is Arnold Schwarzenegger not a celebrity? He can't run. He's not, wasn't born in America. Oh, and I, I know, but I, I didn't think that, I didn't realize that was the, that was a, what was the question again? Well, this must have been a smart crowd. They didn't. They already knew that. <laughs> All right. So I, I think for the next election, it should be uh, AJ and me on the ticket. We're the only two. We're the only two here that can run. Um, yep. So it's true. We got this. Now, 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 what does the ticket look like? Is it real estate political party? Is it AJJ or is it JAJ? Oh, dude, we could re- we could just go AJ, right? Austin. <laughs> oh, like it would be our acronym. I'm thinking that we could have a really cool logo. I think so too. I'm down with this. Libertarian party for me and Jay. We're down. Yeah. yeah. I'm, Jay, I'm, didn't I'm, you, didn't you put your name on the ticket or something once? Wasn't there a story about that? Yeah. I, I registered back in, I think it was 2016. Just so if, uh, if you ever go look up list of presidential candidates, I wasn't actually qualified because I didn't get enough signatures or any signatures. Um, but I did <laughs> register with the FEC. Wait, Carol didn't, Carol didn't even, Register for she, she doesn't want him to be president. I, I didn't ask. Me? I didn't ask her because I, I I didn't want to take the chance of her saying no. Can, can you can you imagine if if your spouse just became president out of the blue? Like you're like, I feel like what they're... happened? <laughs> Sorry, honey. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, Jay, Mr. President, uh, what do you got? You got any plugs for us? Um, I don't. I should. All right. You lose your spot then. Mauricio, what do you got? I'm just going to plug the end of the show. Let's go. <laughs> AJ, plugs? Uh, we are doing our Surprise Arizona. We are coming up on our developments. We're doing our raise. We are halfway uh, built on it. We're doing the last round of raise for it. So everybody check it out. Go to our site and you can check out that project in Phoenix, Arizona. It's awesome. Sounds good. Uh, I, I will plug. add one. I, I I just I just got invited to speak at Limitless, so I will be at Limitless with uh, AJ and presumably Mauricio, um, and uh, and Kyle will be there as well. He just doesn't know it That's yet. That's right. He doesn't know, but he'll be. Yeah, there. Kyle, if you guys can, we're trying to get Kyle to come to Limitless so we can do a podcast together. But he's when is Limitless it? anyway? It's end of know, August end in of Dallas. August. You got to make it, man. Uh, Jay's got the, AJ's got the presidential suite. AJ's got a presidential suite where we could do the pod, and uh, it'll be great. Now I got to go get the presidential. Send, suite send your back. jet to pick me up, AJ. I'll and I'll I'll come. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm going to plug my uh, wife, Badash Investor at Badash Investor on Instagram. Uh, probably TikTok, YouTube, whatever. Go check her out. She posts funny shit all the time. Make you a deal, um, Kyle. I, you, you you fly down to Sarasota, and I will charter a Southwest jet for you and I to fly with a whole bunch of like 180 other people. Um, and uh, I'll cover nice. the cost. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's finish this up. Uh, anything else? We done. Let's get out of here. Done, bro. Got see it. Ya. My drink is gone. Gonna go hit the head. I'll see you next Tuesday. It's Tuesday.